companies in the Bombay Stock Exchange. So Nifty is also giving a return of more than 12%, which is much higher than any kind of savings bank or post office or government schemes. How to invest in Nifty or Sensex? Like exchange traded funds, we can invest or some mutual funds which are investing in Sensex or Nifty or derivatives, which are quite risky as I told earlier. Downside stocks, avoid them. They are just to take away from your whole money, which is a very hard earned money. Penny stocks, avoid them. People think that the value is less than 10 rupees. They will uh, become rich or money will become double in short term. It is not the case actually. There's a very low liquidity. You will not be able to sell them when you uh, want to sell them. And these are the trap materials. As for the market capitalization, there are large caps, mid caps, and small caps. Many companies are there we can find on internet. Respect the wealth creators in India. Mukesh Amani, Anil Amani, Dhirubhai Amani, Ratan Tata, uh, Narayan Murthy, Deepak Parik, Uday Kotak, Anand Mahindra, etc. Respect them. They have created a huge amount of money for their shareholders or investors. So never go into politics like a money adani. No, they have respect. They have created wealth for their shareholders. Now coming towards the take home messages. Sorry. So do not neglect your profession. It is your primary source of income. Never neglect the family. Give them sufficient time. They are the real assets. Maintain relations. Make friends. Keep on spending money. Also, it is very important to keep the money in circulation. Travel, leisure, upgradation of skills or setup. On self spouse children education. Pay your all bills in time. All investments have risk. Trust reliable people. Start the earliest in life to get the best advantage. Try to make a will. It is also a very important point. Try to make a will early in life. Accept that we will also become old. It is a hard reality of life. But in our old age also, we should never be dependent on others by doing the proper investments. So thank you so much for the pleasant and nice hearing. Any questions which can be put in chat box or the moderators can also ask directly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritesh, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, questions, we'll try to take them at the end when we have the panel discussion. So if you have any questions from our audience, we'll put them across. Sure. So now we have uh, the second topic, which is, again, a very interesting topic. It's about GST. A lot of us are paying GST, but we do not really know much about it. Our, our CEOs are maybe calculating the GST and telling us you pay this much, but we do not know a lot about it. So we have Dr. Nalini Kupali who will be telling us about GST, what, when, and how. So Dr. Nalini, please take over. Thank you so much, Arundhati. Uh, it's a wonderful topic and it is the need of the hour. And at the outset, let me thank Voice of Endocrinology and Endocrine Society of India for giving me this opportunity to speak today. So let me share my screen one second. Stop sharing. I'm sorry. Just a moment. The screen share is giving me some trouble suddenly. Just a moment. Uh, is my screen visible? Not as yet. Right. It's visible now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. Uh, today, I, I'm Dr. Lakshmi Nalini Kupale, endocrinologist from Hyderabad. Uh, I have developed this interest in finances because I was scared of it. I didn't know much about it. So I wanted to get over the fear and to get over the fear and nothing like studying. So I am about to finish my MBA in finance. And today I am before you talking about GST. So coming to this. Today I'd be outlining my talk in the following subheadings. Introduction, 
about GST, GST it's subtypes and slabs, terminologies in GST. Sometimes we are very scared about the kind of scary terminology of finances. Just like non-medical people are scared about medical jargon, we are scared about financial jargon many times. So understanding the terminology is very important. And a short note about a GST return filing, you can very easily find it online how to do it. And GST and healthcare, what we should know. And a short summary of it. So without much further ado, I, I will start by telling you that the great-great-grandfather of Lord Rama also collected taxes. And Kalidasa in his Mahakapya, Raghuvamsha, said that it was only for the good that of his subjects that he collected taxes, just like the sun does. And it's not just dating back there. We have the entire Arthashastra written by Chanakya, which told us about polity and finances and economy and about taxation also and GST also. Not GST, but taxation as such. So it said that taxation should not be painful. It should There should be leniency and caution and it should be mutually beneficial and it should be collected in small proportions. These are the basic tenets of uh, the, uh, of taxation, which was mentioned by Chanakya in his Arthashastra. So this is what we need to understand. There's a small slide here where we need to understand what GST is. GST is goods and services tax and it is, uh, removes all the indirect taxes. If you see the direct taxes all remain the same, but the indirect taxes are many at the center level and much more so at the state level. And it is very confusing, haphazard, unequal in each state. So to remove that, this GST was started. So, and to this GST removes all the indirect taxes that you can see here, the custom duty, excise duty, VAT, WCT, whatnot, entertainment tax, luxury tax, all those things it removes. And there is a single thing called GST. So this GST, who needs to pay GST? There are only three categories who can, who have to pay GST. Those whose transactions across 20 lakhs. It's not what you have gained or profited. Suppose you have bought goods or something worth 20 lakhs and you have sold or you have done something for 21 lakhs. It's just 1 lakh profit. But you're crossing that 20 lakh margin in the transaction. So you're supposed to file your GSTs. And whenever, even if you spend a single rupee also interstate in uh, from one state to another state, you have to file your GST. And then any online transaction, even if it is for 5 rupees or 1 rupee, you need to pay your GST. Once you see your online Amazon and all those bills, you see that GST is levied even for the smallest of small items because online transactions also attract GST. So moving further, you need to understand why the old taxation system was so cumbersome. You see the cent there are central taxes in the indirect taxation scene, which are central taxes which are common throughout the country and state taxes which are individual for individual uh, states. So there's custom uh, duties and all those things for the central taxes. When it comes to state, there's VAT, WBC, CCT, TDS, sales. It's also confusing. So if we think of entertainment, there's entertainment tax. There is gambling, there's betting, there's betting tax, there's luxury tax, there's surcharges and cesses. These are all the things which makes taxation different. If it is certain system in Bihar, it is certain another system of taxation level in uh, Telangana. So this difference attracted businesses in certain states and repelled businesses in certain states. So development did not happen in our country so well. So taxation, uniform taxation was the need of the hour. So the most important day to remember in this context is 1st July 2017. It is also the doctor's day. What happened on this day was a midnight session was uh, started and GST came into force. Why this midnight session? There are only three other instances where midnight sessions for both the houses was called for. One was when we got independence, when once we celebrated the Silver Jubilee, once we celebrated the Golden Jubilee. So GST is as important as the freedom of our nation because it brought the entire nation under a unified indirect taxation system and it's a great reform for the entire country. So what are the components of this GST? What are the slabs of the GST? GST, is, as we spoke, is nothing but it is a unified single taxation system and it is levied upon goods and services at this, as the name says. It has certain objectives also. It is a unified, simplified taxation system. As you can see here, all those things are gone and only one thing is there. It reduces the tax cascading. So it's simpler to invest in certain areas, in, in all the areas, and it promotes the ease of doing business, more business, more growth of the country. So GST has, in, in short, improved the economic performance of our country. 
So what are the components of GST when we are talking about? So when we are saying a certain thing is attracting, uh, suppose, for example, uh, to 18% tax, tax, are we paying the center the 18%, state 18% and all those things? No. Whenever we are attracting some kind of a tax on GST, it has, center is doing so many things. It has a center's component of it. Then it has a state's component of it. So government also needs to needs to work. And our tax money is what helps the government work. So whatever be the slab of GST, 50% will be the centers. That is central GST or CGST. And 50% will be states GST. That is SGST. If you are living in a union territory like Puducherry or in um, Delhi, that is instead of state, you say union territory GST. So what is this integrated GST? Suppose if you have a... Uh, material made in Rajasthan and you're selling in Telangana. So there is two states. Now you're fighting for the tax there. But it is now integrated. It is an interstate transaction. So this integrated GST is collected by the center. 50% is kept by the center. And what happens to the next 50%? It is kept by the state where it is sold. That is destination GST is nothing but IGST. We need to understand this because there's a lot of online uh, purchasing that is going on. Uh, site of production is different and site of uh, payment is different. Who is receiving what taxes is we need to understand a basic thing about it. So once we understood about those things, terminologies, basic terminologies of GST, what are the slabs of GST? The slabs are, there is no tax at all. That will come for essential commodities, 0%. So for mass consumption goods, it is 5%. It is 12 to 18 percent for standard goods, and uh, some as as the comfort and luxury level increases, the slab changes and it increases. And it comes to luxury items like a car, perfume, sunscreen, things like that attract 28 percent, and sometimes cess charge also. So as luxury increases, your spending ability is increasing. Your spending ability is increasing. The government will want a percentage of it so that it can cater better to us. So the tax percentage increases. So as we spoke, essential zero, mass communication five, 12 to 18 for standard rate and demerit goods 28%. So this is what is the list of the things along with the serials. All these things have no tax. 5% GST is both these things. We need to remember sugar and insulin when it comes to endocrinologists, they come under the 5% GST tax. And then we have 12%. These are all the things which have as uh, attract 12% GST. As the convenience increases, see those frozen meat products, fruit juices, the GST percentage is increasing. 18% pastries and cakes. Ice creams are all 18% GST. Cars, tobacco, and all the luxury items which we can always do away with, but still we use, they all attract a very high GST, that is 28% of GST. So let us understand this GST with this bill that we are seeing here. It is a online takeaway thing. Takeaway food restaurants, as we have seen, takeaways come under 5% GST. So you can see here, there is CGST, 2.5%. Center is taking 2.5 out of the 5. SGST, that is state is taking 2.5%. That is first thing. Now, here we are seeing again with an example, a bill. Uh, here in this bill, you will see that it, this product was made in Hosur, Tamil Nadu. And where is, is it? Where is the place of supply? Telangana. So, production site is different and supply site is different. So, with GST will come here. It is IGST or integrated GST which comes in here. You can see here. So place of supply is very important because the place of supply determines whether the transaction is interstate and subsequently the type of GST it will attract. So the supply is on Telangana, the final purchase is in Telangana. So the IGST, the 50% component after going off to the center, the remaining 50% will go to the state that is Telangana state. So this is now that is what we spoke about the IGST example. Now let us see the slab along with the type of GST. Can you see here? There is another thing given here. That is a tax rate. That is what slab. Every bill usually shows the tax slab out there. Even in the earlier bill of takeaway food, what was shown the slab rate 2.5 plus 2.5. That is 5% was shown there also. The slab is shown there. So apart from this, what should we know? We should know there are certain codes. What tells you that this particular item that was bought attracted 12%, right? You should know which item is giving what percentage because there can be frauds here as the seller might 
pay put it as a higher percentage of this thing when this comes into 12 percent and if the seller puts 28 percent gst that is definitely a fraud that is happening here so these there are certain codes and rules for um, for this gst to classify them so if it is hsn system it is for goods if it is for service accounting codes it is for services it tells which one goes under what thing okay so moving on from that, we need to understand another terminology when we are talking about the GST here. There is something called GST registration number. GST registration number, it is all GST, just GS10 it is called. It is the identification number and a 15 digit unique number assigned to each taxpayer. And it and who should register and who should pay the limit? As we told, those three categories, those whose businesses are 20 lakhs and, uh, or more, special cases are 10 lakhs and online business and those who are doing business interstate should have this GST registration and they should fill their this thing. How should we file these? These uh, returns should be filed monthly quarterly or annually and those are the situations which we just spoke about so this is a step that you can get it very easily on very online portals how to pay the gst it is a nine step protocol wherein you just register and you go about with these step protocols it is very easy then you can also for those people who cannot use online you can go in with the offline process and it is very easy you can fill gstr one and two forms there are about 11 gstr forms return forms which are present so you should also know which form to fill so that information is also very easily available for you here you need to this is these are the steps of uh, finding uh, the downloading the gst return form that you can find very easily in the uh, uh, online network portals many of them so this is a summary of the forms that you can see which category you come under and which form you should file in every registered person should fill in the form one that should be remembered only view only forms will be 2B, things like that exist. So read which category you come under and fill all the respective forms which, come, which are there for you. So now coming to businesses, when we talk about businesses, they need to register, they need to file returns and pay GST regularly. Uh, monthly, earlier it used to be multiple times a month, now it is monthly or quarterly also can be done and annually also it has to be done. When businesses do, they have to do it regularly like this. But when individuals do, they pay GST only while making purchases like the takeaway bill that you've seen and the online purchase bill that you have seen. So the liability to pay GST typically falls on the supplier of the goods or the person who is giving the services like a healthcare provider. You are, you, are, you are liable to pay that chair that you have bought for your patient to sit in. When you purchased it, you paid GST for it. So you are liable to pay the GST and you are liable to pay the returns for it and you have to you have to register yourself. So except for the cases where there is reverse charges where recipient is liable, you have to pay as a service provider, you have to pay the GST. So the threshold limit for GST registration base varies based on the type of the business and the location and with a higher limit for smaller locations the limits are higher your business is small you wouldn't be able to pay so much so that is why higher limit is there now coming to gst and healthcare how is this important for us what it means for your everyday working and if you're starting a clinic fresh and new what does this gst mean to you so you know in with respect to this you need to understand one very very important term called input tax credit Sounds a very scary term, but easier than the Greek and Latin of medicine. It just means that GST paid by a taxable person on any purchase of goods or services that are used or will be used for the business. And ITC value can be reduced from the GST payable on the sales of the same thing by the taxable person only after fulfilling certain conditions. Health care and the service that we provide is exempted from GST. But the clinic that you purchased, the curtains that you got, the chair that you got, the pen that you got, the stethoscope that you got, everything is with respect after paying the GST. But the service that you are giving is free of GST. So you cannot claim back in return. So what is happening? Let us understand with an example here. What is the impact on patients and providers? That is us. With this example, the impact on patients through the doctors. Suppose uh, we are taking a, a dialysis unit. So hospitals have to pay 12% tax on dialysis, machine tubing and all those things. And earlier the tax lab was 5%. Now because of GST, it has become 12% rate. So in that tax lab, we are paying the, the, the cost of dialysis has gone up. So once the cost of dialysis for the hospital is more, 
So what will be the bill for the patient? The bill for the patient is also more. So the dialysis cost is increasing for the patient. So the patients have to shell out more for their health related needs because it is attracting a higher tax for the hospitals. So understand this because providers get affected, then ultimately patients will get affected. So how is it directly affecting the providers? We, as we just now spoke, at present healthcare services are he exempt from GST. So as they're exempted from GST, we are, we are not eligible to avail credit on those input taxes paid, which ultimately becomes an extra cost for us. We have incurred all these costs to set up a clinic. So where will we put that cost? we put that cost on having a higher registration fees and higher fee for the patient. So structuring of our fee and if, and the healthcare unit working itself will be a little on the higher side. So in this way, GST has increased the day-to-day -day operating cost of the cost of the healthcare unit. And the uh, thus GST has impacted healthcare structures in the way the healthcare services are given. But what was the primary aim of GST? to decrease the burden on the people. So what is actually happening now? It is increasing the burden on people. So how can people overcome this? People can overcome this by taking healthcare insurance and pay the premiums. So they are all insured against all this GST so that even the higher cost levied by hospitals will not impact them. But the problem is that citizens, when they are encouraged to have healthcare insurance premium, the premium for healthcare insurance attracts 18% GST. So premium is more expensive. So healthcare uh, insurance, which is taken, is taken for an amount which is insignificant or which is not useful for them actually. But, and many people don't take healthcare at all. In India, around 20 to 30% of individuals do not avail any healthcare facilities because they cannot afford a healthcare facility. So imagine that and imagine the GST and it is 80% on healthcare insurance. How many people take healthcare insurance? So that is in fact becoming counterproductive. In the, It is looking as if it's productive. It is helpful, but it is not helping us. So ultimately GST depicts its own purpose and it is increasing the healthcare services cost. So for this, they decided that to levy 5% charges on specific commodities like room rent, which is more than 5,000 and all these certain bills have, it has been levied so that the hospitals will not accrue so much of losses and they will not charge so high for the patient. So in that, it was decided that not everything will be free of GST, but only 5% will be levied. That way, ITC can be taken advantage of and some GST benefit can be take, taken the benefit of. So summarizing my talk, it, it, GST is all about goods and services tax. No, we are not paying 18% uh, to center, 18% to state, 18% IGST, 18% UG. No, the total amount is divided between center and state because both the governments are taking care of us. So equally, the particular slab is divided and you have central SGST, UTGST and IGST. So slabs are, as we've spoken about, nothing to 28% in, in, including the CES. And then we have GST and GST filing. It is important to register, especially when you have a business or of about 20 lakhs or when you are operating in multiple states, you have clinic in multiple places and then and then it crosses the border, borders of the states. It You have to play, uh, pay the GST or you have to file the returns for the GST. And then you have to, if you are um, uh, doing an online business, online consultation and all that, it again involves GST filing requirement. So it is very important to understand that ITC is is one thing which is not there in healthcare and that that is not giving us the benefit and likewise you have to remember that the healthcare cost is rising but at the same time you need to remember this GST and what you have paid the GST for each and every item in your clinic or hospital and then structure every slab of the payment at each quarter wherever that is there that like that way you can recover some costs and that is for your benefit but unfortunately that increases the pressure on general population so remember always the government should also do this now, as chanakya said ideally government should tackle it taxes like a honeybee sucks honey in the right amount so that the flower also flourishes and bee also can survive it should be mutually beneficial and never burdensome Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and I invite all the uh, uh, everyone to SECON 2023, which is there from 14 to 17 December at Hyderabad.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nalini. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, we learned a lot of new things about GST. Uh, please stay on because we'll have call you back for the panel discussion later on. I will now invite a senior endocrinologist, Dr. Manoj Chadha, sir, who will be telling us about uh, the very important aspect of money making in markets. So, uh, sir. Uh, thank you, Arundhati. Thank you, Voice of Endocrinology. And it's uh, great to have colleagues like Ritesh and Nalini uh, on board. <clears throat> so I've uh, heard the both the talks with keen interest. I really enjoyed Ritesh's talk. And I'm going to have some bone of contention with Nalini during the, uh, I mean, the discussion. So let me uh, get to my uh, talk. You know, uh, I think Ritesh has set the tone for the program. Uh, we are all here to survive, lead a comfortable life. And uh, talking for myself, uh, from a middle class family, I had a decent childhood, but I can't say I had a luxurious childhood. And uh, <clears throat> after becoming a doctor, we were interns at uh, 400 rupees a day, uh, a month a resident at 800 rupees a month and then a lecturer at about 2000 rupees a month. So we have come from that phase where money was very important and we had to save to have a good, secure uh, middle and old age. I think uh, what is important uh, and why I thought of taking this talk were two things. Uh, Pre-COVID, I met a patient of mine. So in Mumbai, when you talk of money, you either talk of Sindhis or Gujaratis. So this Sindhi patient of mine said, Doc, it's very important to earn money. Earn money, earn lots of money. But at the same time, if you don't spend that money and just leave it behind, then you are a fool. Because please remember, everything can be replaced, multiplied, except time. Once you have lost time, it's gone. These are the two books which have really influenced me. And I would you know, suggest that you spend a little money and get these books for yourself. I have, A third book is missing out here, which is equally important. And that is saying, living poor and dying rich. A lot of our parents, our seniors have left behind hefty bank balances for their, you know, the kids. And uh, it's really you know, not a good idea that you don't spend your money on yourself. So while I'm talking about making money, I'm also stressing on the fact that make enough money. So you need to decide what is enough for you. We'll come to that. And there's no idea saying I have a huge bank balance but I am not in a position to travel. I can't eat what I want. So that's where the importance of good health comes in. Uh, so, you know, always save for a particular goal. You look at your income and then match it with your budget or the other way around, as they say in the rich dad, poor dad, look at your expenses and see that you get enough income. Ritesh has stressed on the importance of investments. Now, when we are saying our needs, we're looking at our daily needs, our eating, our res residence, our electricity, telephone. Uh, in, edu in addition, we are always worried. See, Indian parents talk about education for the children. Uh, some of us are young, not me, but some of you. And marriage may still be pending. You may be looking for a house. You may be having a home loan. You're looking for taking care of your hobbies. These are requirements that I think most of us have to look at. But what is most important also and which we should never forget is an emergency corpus. I think COVID was an eye-opener. Many of us did not work for weeks, did not work for months. And in other professions, people lost their job six months, one year without a job. So you need to know your monthly budget and you need to keep a six-month emergency corpus in a safe place 
with absolutely low risk. And then on top of that, you have your pleasure, your hobbies, which I mean, if you can afford it, you do it. Otherwise, you forego it. So you have the, you know, these are the optional expenses. And you then you have the obligatory expenses, like I said, about your food, your telephone, your electricity, your travel, the education fees, your EMIs. So the obligatory expenses and your hobbies. It's also a good idea to know what is your net worth, your investments, your savings, your fixed deposits, your stocks. Don't count your residential property as a investment or add it to your net worth because there's no way you're going to sell your house property. I hope that day doesn't ever come. So keep your net worth when you start your journey so that you know where you are standing and where you need to get. Uh, you must be wondering why I have put all these different buckets. Again, this is a Gujubai uh, teaching that based on your needs, you must have different buckets or different investment avenues. You may need something right in the next one year or two years. You may need something after 10 years. You may need something after 25, 30 years when you retire. So the investment pattern changes depending on your needs. This doesn't work that you put everything into one bucket and keep saying that I'll take out of it as and when the need comes. Please, you need different buckets for different requirements. The important thing is to understand that we are working towards an income. And as Ritesh said, it should be an ethical source of income. But there is a difference between being just comfortable, being rich, that means be able to afford whatever you need. Now, please understand there's a difference between need and wants. So as long as you keep your needs to minimum, you keep your needs as required, but your wants to minimum, your requirements may also go down. And then there is a person who's wealthy, who can just take care of all his needs without working. So the idea is to move from middle class to rich to wealthy so that we don't have to worry where the next paycheck is going to come from. You work because you enjoy your work and not because you're obliged to work. So that's why the alternate source of income, all these talks to get you ingrained and you know sensitized to investments. As I mentioned in the beginning, you need to look at your obligatory expenses, optional expenses. And I repeat, you have to have a monthly budget a annual budget because that's how you will decide what is your requirement. So coming to the crux of the talk, when you look at the investment options, you have got immediate. That means in the next one to two years, you're going to require that money. You have short term goals. You have between say one and three or maximum five years for that investment. And then you will need that money. And then you have long-term goals, which go anything above 5 to 25, 30 years. So the reason why you need to define these goals is here you can take risks. This you can take a balanced sort of view. And this is absolutely no risk because these are obligatory expenses. Your child has to go to college. You want to get your child married. You want to get married if you're not in that age. And there is no way you can change that. So don't take risk with these immediate bucket, but a little balanced view with the short term and then you can take risk with the long term goals because you, might, uh, you must remember higher risk, higher returns, lower risk, lower returns. And as uh, Ritesh also mentioned and a good friend of mine says, at this stage, when you're talking of short term investments, you're not looking at return on investment. You're looking at return of investment. It should not go down and at least that much amount you should get back. Investment should be in habit right at the beginning of the month. As I said, most people say, this is my income, this is my expense, and this is what is left behind. So I'm going to save like that. No, this is your income. These are your investment goals. And then what is left, you manage your month. And that's why again, referring to the rich dad, poor dad, 
that if you have a certain amount of requirement, you will jolly well work to get that much of requirement. And as time goes on, you go on proportionately increasing your investments and no way do you dip into funds which are meant for long-term goals. And again, a repetition of uh, Ritesh's statement, don't get swayed away from the market forces. Uh, these are the various options that we have with us. Uh, I think this is the holy grail for us. Provident Fund is a must for all self-employed doctors because we have really no safe source of income later on in the uh, twilight years of our life. FT also people feel is a very safe option, but it's a low investment, I mean low return and low risk. It is not zero risk because if God forbid your FD is in a bank which goes bankrupt or closes down, you have an insurance it used to be of 1 lakh rupees, now it's become about 5 lakh rupees. So keep that in mind. I think uh, the equity-based uh, investments, whether it's in stock or mutual funds, is what is really important. Uh, I think our seniors, our parents really used to have a lot of faith in real estate and gold. I'm not saying that they are useless. They are a must in that. But gold should be about less than 10% of your investments. And real estate should be for your own consumption. That means your residence and your clinic. So the asset allocation is very important. As you grow older, your risk goes down. So from stocks, you move towards debt funds and FDs. Uh, that's the important part. And we'll see if there is some discussion uh, during the panel discussion. So I started off by saying that you need to know how much you need. Because it, there's no idea saying I've got crores of rupees in my investment bank when I'm not even using them properly and I don't even need them. So a good idea is to look at a corpus, which is about 25 times your projected annual cost, taking the inflation into picture. And I'll tell you why, how this 25x comes in. But you go into equity-based funds, balance funds, debt funds, depending upon the bucket that you are talking about. This would be low risk, low returns, balanced and equity is between 12 and 18 percent and you can look at uh, getting a good return over the long period of time as a matter of fact there is a statement that in the worst case scenario of everything going bad war oil prices a seven year cycle will help you get over all your losses so if it's anything in between five six years just don't worry go ahead with the equity investments it's important to budget your expenses and uh, I think uh, the important thing is look at this type of investments. You know, uh, Ritesh talked about brokerage and the commission that you pay. We should all look at direct investments uh, in the mutual funds. In stocks, it has to be through a brokerage house. But that's uh, the variable amount of uh, brokerage they talk. But the mutual fund, the catch is that if you go through an agent, what is called as a regular investment, you pay that agent 1% every year of the value of the investment. I mean, the uh, you know, your corpus. So today you might have invested 1 lakh and say, okay, I'll pay him 1% per year. But that 1 lakh becomes 10 lakh, 25 lakhs, 30 lakhs. And the agent keeps getting 1% per year for what? So to help you fill the form, I, I think... It's like saying that a hypothyroid patient came to me, I prescribed thyroxin and I said, now listen, thyroxin is lifelong. Um, every year you have to send uh, me so much money because that's my bill for diagnosing and treating hypothyroid. I mean, that is ridiculous. Yes, you must go to an investment advisor, go to someone who will help you pay his fees upfront. Don't ask for favors, but don't pay fees for the rest of your investment life, you know. So that's very important. I mean, being lazy, I don't understand. It's very detrimental to your financial health. Don't look at it like that. So I was saying we need to take a corpus, which is about 25x or 25 of your projected annual requirement. The reason why we said that is because if you withdraw 4% of that corpus, once you retire, I mean, doctors generally don't retire, but let's say you do retire or you're in a situation you can't work or you don't want to work. 
then 4% of that corpus should be your annual requirement. Maximum, you can go 6%. That is still less than you know, the returns that you would get on your investment. So your corpus is there for indefinite time. It will never get over. God forbid there are some bad times. You even have to withdraw 5-10% upfront. Still, you have a decent corpus to take you past 100 years. So don't worry about that. And uh, I think this is very important for all of us that do not depend upon your children as an age-old support. This used to be an old teaching, but it doesn't uh, really uh, stand to. Not because children are not interested in you, but by the time you are 85 and 90 and you know looking for help, they are also 60, 65 and you know uh, tackling their retirement. So you have to look after yourself. And as you go towards your goal, whether it's marriage, education, your holiday goal, or your retirement goal, you have to move from the risk equity-based funds to the debt and hybrid funds with lower risk. And uh, I think I'm running out of time. So just to give you an idea, as Ritesh has given you some idea already, that we've got equity-based funds for the long term. And they give you the best returns uh, very conservatively between 12 and 15%. If you're lucky and you have a good fund manager, it may be 20, 25% also. And similarly, the flexi cap or the multi cap funds, where the fund manager has the option of moving from large cap to mid cap to small cap, they give you a very good return. And then, like I said, when you're looking at safety, you have to accept returns which are in the fixed deposit range. But still, you're not taxed as long as the money is in the fund, whereas fixed deposits, the interest is taxed even if it doesn't reach your bank. Uh, look at one to two funds per category. Your portfolio should not have more than six or eight funds because it becomes difficult to manage. Uh, growth option is what you should look for, not the dividend option. Once in six months, uh, you can review or you can go to a professional for help. SIP for investments. Investment should increase as your income increases and systematic withdrawal as you move towards retirement. Uh, I think to stress at the end that compounding is a wonder of the world. Ritesh gave you a different example. I'm telling you of two endocrinologists aged 35 years old. Uh, two and a half lakhs annually, this first endocrinologist starts investing from 35 to 60 years. That's 25 years. And the second one says, no, no, I want to enjoy my life. I need some fun. So for 10 years, he's busy taking his spouse around and uh, looking after children and luxury goods and all that. And then he says, okay, I've lost 10 years. I'll put 5 lakhs every every year. Uh, and at the end of 60 years, what is going to happen? Uh, the one who started later has invested 75 lakhs. The one who started earlier, 25 years, that means 10 years earlier, has put in 62 lakhs, 50,000. So there's about 12, 12 lakh difference. Uh, this guy's corpus is 1.5 crores, whereas this guy's corpus is 2 crores. So that's the power of time that you stay in the market. And if the rate of return is 10% or more than that, see the difference in the corpus, 1.75 versus 2.7 crores. So it's just to give you an idea, stay there, doesn't matter. Start small, but start early. I think the, what I've tried to tell you is start early. Don't underestimate the power of compounding. Keep your needs minimal and wants even less than that. So that as uh, one of my friends said that if your needs are taken care of by the income and your wants can be just as and when they come up, you'll be a happy person. Don't evade taxes. Don't go for accumulating cash. White money in your account and in your balance sheet is a great tool as and when you need uh, a loan for your clinic or your hospital or expansion. But try to become debt-free before you think of retirement. No loans for leisure or luxury. Be healthy. In school, you must have said, uh, learned, you know, that health is wealth. This is the time when it's really true. And don't put money in your lockers and under your bed because it's useless. So I'm going to end at this stage. Uh, Probably we'll get into a panel discussion. I think I've crossed five minutes, but uh, we'll you know try to make up during the discussion. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, sir. That was a wonderful talk. And I believe that after these three talks, a lot of us who were in that slot where I do not understand was the key tagline. From there, we've moved on to, I'm just beginning to understand a little bit. It'll take us some more um, of this. Yeah. And so for a little more discussion on this, we will request all our speakers to stay on. And we have two other endocrinologists. Now, you know, I'll tell you a very interesting thing. When we started off this conversation, me and Dr. Nitin, that we need to, you know, uh, bring in people people who are interested in finance. So it was a th that, that thought was at the back that females would not be there much. I mean, you could just maybe bring in one or two. So we have this women in chronology group has dropped this message about, you know, how many people know about finance. And I expected no answers. Within five minutes, I had a flurry of, you know, WhatsApp messages. And I was like, wow. So this is indeed so as you can see here, the ratio is three is to two. So that is interesting. Women power coming up again in terms of finances also. So now we'll welcome Dr. Varsha Jagdab and Dr. Kranti Kadilkar, who will also be a part of the panel discussion, along with our previous three speakers. And I believe they have a very interesting set of questions there. So over to you. All right. Uh, first and foremost, uh, yeah, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful <laughs> gathering of uh, uh, Finance endocrinologist, I would say. So uh, let me give my first question to Dr. Ritesh. Wonderful lecture to set the tone today. Uh, so my question is, after having zeroed in on the share of 10 companies, we have decided that we have 10 companies and such so much, so much amount that we are going to uh, invest. Uh, how do you diversify your funds? Like how many shares of one company over the other? How do you diversify if you have to uh, put your money into 10 companies? How do you do that? So thank you, Mr. Dr. Kranti. It is a, a very bit, uh, it is a bit tricky thing. See, I don't uh, go by the numbers of companies that I have to allocate my funds into such and such numbers of companies or sectors. What I find is the opportunity. Suppose if I have, if I want to invest in 10 companies, it is not necessary that when I have money, all the say, all those 10 companies are available at the rate which I want to buy. So I will invest in those companies which are at good price at that time. I may increase the bit more investment in those companies which are at a bit cheaper rate as compared to other companies. I will hold them. Later on when I have more money, I will keep on investing in those companies which are further down or which are at a good available rates. So that it is not necessary I have to diversify like 10 companies. I have to put 10% in each company. I don't like this concept. I have a different concept. See, all concepts are individualized. So I keep on buying those companies which are available at a cheaper rates. Good companies, but at cheaper rates at that point of time. So this is necessary. It is not uh, worth that. You have to buy those companies which are a very high valuation, which are at very high rates. Good companies. It is not. They will not give a good return in the long run. So buy those companies which are available at a good valuations at a good rate so that they can give you a higher return. Maybe one company, maybe two companies, maybe five companies, maybe eight companies. Not necessary. You have to put money in all those 10 companies at the same point of time. All right. Uh, anybody else wants to add, a, add on to this? Uh, yeah. A May I can answer something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sorry. So what Dr. Ritesh is... Uh, said is that uh, this one another concept is that whatever your amount of uh, you want to make in equity this ideal is 120th of 160th of the total in that nifty 50 one of mm. the that is the idea that 160 to 120th of the total amount you can invest in one this is one of the safest way but obviously those are having good knowledge they can spend more and more in particular uh, kind of equity Another comment is I know only when the height in centimeter minus 100 is ideal body weight. But today I learned height in 100 minus something, 100 minus age is something. So Ritesh, can you again tell this? What was <laughs> that? Uh, thank you, sir, for asking again. See, it is about the risk taking appetite. Suppose if I am uh, having an age of 40 years, right now I am 48. So as per the age, it is a formula that 100 minus age I can take that much amount of risky bet in the overall investments. So our uh, overall investments of uh, around 52% should be in the equity, which are quite high risk. Lesser than that okay. in the paper bets. But as the age advances, suppose if I'm 80 years now, then 80% will be in the safer bets, 20% only mm -hmm. risk taking. 
So it depends upon the right, risk taking yeah. effect at that point of age, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, uh, Dr. Nalini, I have a question for you. I mean, we uh, yes. discussed about emergency funds. And, you know, with uh, this past history of COVID now, many of us, you know, we were like for a good period of time, we were without much income. And, you know, that really reminded us the importance of emergency funds. So um, what do you think? I mean, how much should be the emergency fund and how where should we actually park this money? Very important question, Varsha, now that we have faced a situation. And uh, Chadda sir already mentioned in his presentation about emergency fund. With, when it comes to emergency fund, we need to ask ourselves three important questions. First of all, what is this emergency fund and how much should you have it? Second question would be, how do you allocate and how do you calculate this emergency fund? And third would be, where should you park this emergency fund? So emergency fund is anything that it requires a sudden fund unexpected sudden fund and if you don't if you are not prepared for it it will lead you to a debt so that is emergency fund and it is that account you maintain and the money you may you put into that account as an emergency em account emergency money that is emergency fund so this emergency fund there is a, it's very difficult to predict how much one needs but usually it is either 6 months of monthly expenditure or 12 months 6 to 12 months takka monthly expenditure that is considered a emergency fund that you should have at a given time so now how will you calculate this emergency fund so there are four important factors that you need to consider first thing is you should know how much your monthly expenditure is what is your budget monthly so average how much are you spending Second thing is you need to define the time period. Are you Do you want to have an emergency fund for six months or do you want to have an emergency fund for 12 months? So define the time period that you have for emergency fund and then calculate it. Now it becomes very easy how much time you would take to build that emergency fund. So calculate that. Now when you're parking that amount in certain places, those areas are giving you some returns also. So you should know the returns, how much you're getting from those funds. So what should be this, what could be this emergency things, not just COVID or health related emergencies, but it could be a sudden job loss or it could be a major house repair or a vehicle repair or something which requires a lot of money. So that is the emergency fund you're talk, that you're talking about and it should be significant amount. So where do you park the amount? As you know, it is an emergency. It should, the basic minimum criteria for it are two things. First thing, it, it should be liquid. That means you should have the amount with you in a very short span of time. Second thing is wherever you're putting it, it should not be in a very uncertain position. It should be very safe position, low risk situation. So what are the categories in this? First thing, you have your savings bank account. You can park your amount uh, in the savings bank, but that will yield very less, 3% or 3.5%. And when it comes in also, it is taxable. Then next you have recurrent RDs. RDs will be a little more better. They'll give you 4 to 8% of interest. But at the same time, uh, once uh, that amount comes, it is also taxable. So third thing, after savings account, after RDs, you have your FDs. FDs, they're relatively safe, re yield higher amount, but they are taxable. The problem with FDs and RDs is when you are breaking those RDs and FDs prematurely, you have to pay a penalty. So that penalty amount will be there and there is loss of um, that investment which is there. So that point also needs to be kept in mind. The third uh, category is a highly liquid fund. And this highly liquid fund would be like uh, bonds. So these bonds, uh, they mature within three months or something. So you can have them. There is no penalty involved in the bonds. They are low risk. When you're talking about bonds, debt investments, they're, they're usually low risk. And uh, they have higher, they give more than savings account. They may not be higher than 7%, 8%, but definitely more than the savings account, which is there. And the last category is the ultra short duration funds. What are these ultra short duration funds? These are more or less like FDs only, but they do not involve penalties. They are, they give you a tax benefit once you save them for more than three years. Mm -hmm. So these are the liquid areas where you need to park your amount and it gives you some inter interest in return back. So this is how you need to plan your emergency fund so that you sustain yourself. So the bottom line is emergencies don't announce and come. You need to be prepared. So when life gives you emergency, we don't know. So always having emergency fund is the most important thing in an investment. 
thank you nalani for the answer chadda sir really, you had a yeah you had just a to correct you if so, this financial yeah, yeah. <laughs> works there is no indexation of the benefits yeah so it's going so to it's, be it's just like fd only thing is you don't lose anything and you can withdraw it at 24 hours notice mm -hmm. that's the beauty of it so liquid funds and uh, the uh, very short debt funds are the way forward Yes, so to summarize, I mean, we should park 6 to 12 months of our monthly expenditure in liquid funds and in short duration debt funds or in FDs. Right. So, uh, Kranti, would you like to take the next question? Yeah. Um, Just a minute, uh, Dr. Padada has a question. He has asked, what about gold? Can uh, anybody talk about that? Right. So, Nalini, uh, any comment from your side? Uh, we'll we'll take that gold question. Uh, it's a very difficult question, especially to ask me because Indian women consider gold not as investment but as something very precious and <laughs> Lakshmi hoti hai gold to. So yeah. physical gold is as a as a kind of investment is a tough thing to take on for women, especially Indian women. But uh, virtual gold is something we need to keep in mind. That digital gold is very important and it is a method of investment and it will give us um, returns also. But though they are at a lower price, what can be assured is the purity. There can be fraud in physical gold, but in digital gold, there is no fraud. There is 99.5% purity, which is there in uh, digital gold. The second thing is in sovereign gold bonds. RBI keeps giving the sovereign gold bonds uh, time to time. And those gold bonds are a way of investment for us again. And uh, we can uh, have these gold exchange traded funds. They are more or like like uh, gold investment when it is safer than the physical gold. And okay, again, digital gold or virtual gold is something which will give us a lot of uh, safety with respect to the fraud which can happen in physical gold. And then we have the gold mutual funds also. Gold mutual funds are like just like investing in stock of gold companies. And this helps in diversification. So gold as investment is a tough thing for an Indian woman. But then it is needed to give you stability because gold is one thing which has always been in, on a rise. Irrespective of the market trends, gold, gold has been on a rise and has been stable. So gold acts as a hedge. Gold is of store. It always increases. And gold is always highly liquid. I hope that helps, sir. Yeah, so I think... Yeah, gold uh, is gold. Gold yeah. is gold. Never. Gold is, a, is a, you know, like we say, a necessary evil. It should be a part <laughs> of your investment. But don't compare it with equity funds. Because at the end of 5 or 10 years, you might have gained 4 or 6%. And you might not even beat inflation. But in like you said, it's a hedge fund. Hedge so fund. It should be a part of our portfolio. And in the... Uh, mutual fund or gold bonds, not in physical. Yes. And that's not counted. I mean, you have your physical, physical gold is never countable, sir. Like I said, your residential <laughs> house is not counted in your network. <laughs> and additionally, physical board uh, gold, if we have it for more than uh, three years, it has capital gains, short term capital gains, but digital gold doesn't have those short term capital gains. So that is one more benefit that we see in digital gold. So right, Nalini has given a homework for all of us. So, you know, we should learn more about sovereign gold bonds, SGBs, which get released and uh, mm. on a regular intervals. We need to find about them and invest into them. Uh, like we do SIP in equity, maybe putting up, uh, you know, uh, six monthly, uh, some uh, allotment of our investment into these SGBs will give us the diversification that we need. Yes, Randi. Yes. So my question is to uh, Dr. Chadda, sir. So if an endocrinologist say I have taken a home loan, which is now the interest rate is around 9%. And now I have some surplus amount in the bank. So after hearing this lecture, I am thinking, should I uh, use the surplus amount for equity investment completely? Or should I just finish off the home loan first? Taking into consideration the rate now is 9% for home loan interest rate. So, so Kranti, I think the important question I will ask you is, are you in the early part of the loan or are you in the latter part of the loan? Early. Because the EMI that is calculated is cheating us. Yeah. When you look at your statement at the end of every year, you will find that in the first few years, your principal has hardly changed. It's only interest yeah. that is going on. And in the latter years, it's your principal which is coming down draft quickly and the interest is hardly anything. So if in the first, say, 25% of the loan period, please start 
prepaying the loan. But if you're in the last 30% of the loan period, doesn't matter because you're not paying 9%. You're only paying 9% on paper. You're actually exactly. paying 4 or 5% only. So you please invest it with Ritesh and uh, yes. make more money. Yes. This is very important, and sir. We don't remember, realize the thing is The home loan that you pay, the principal amount also goes towards ATC. The interest yes. amount also is written off. So all in all, it makes sense to prepay only in the first few years of the loan, not in the latter years. Thank you, sir. Yes, so uh, I have a question for Dr. Ritesh. Uh, so, sir, as you said that, you know, you have to look for opportunities and uh, once you get the opportunities, then you enter the stocks. So, for example, uh, if I'm an endocrinologist, I'm not very well versed with stocks, but uh, I do want to invest in uh, stocks without, you know, going through mutual funds. Is there a way out where I can be invested in equity without... Uh, um, you know, going through the mutual fund way, can I do an SIP in stocks by um, some way where I you know I have I know that okay, these five companies will give me return in the long run, and I want to stay invested in them for twenty years, and let me do an SIP into them rather than uh, looking at the dips because I may not be a regular market watcher, and I want to just continue doing SIP. Yeah, thanks, ma'am, for the uh, question. So SIP is possible in stocks also. There are many ways. Some companies or brokerage houses uh, give this opportunity directly via their apps where we can opt for the stock SIP on the specified date of that month. That money is deducted from the account by according to the number of shares we had opted. The same day closing date is uh, debited from our account and stocks are credited in our account next day or next to next day. Another way is manual. We select our own specified date that we will invest that much uh, into that much shares on that very date of every month. So that is also an SIP. It is a manual SIP. The companies give opportunity to do a SIP directly by their apps. So that is also possible. So like a mutual fund stock SIP is also a very possible thing nowadays. Unlike uh, previous days where it was quite cumbersome. So SIP can be done in mutual funds as well as the stocks also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the answer. Uh, any audience questions uh, uh, we want to discuss in the middle? Dr. Arundhati? Uh, no, we haven't got any audience questions as yet, so you can continue. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, Sir has already uh, discussed about uh, the difference between uh, regular and direct mutual funds. But I would like to, we would like to know from Dr. Chadda, Sir, uh, what are exchange traded funds actually? And how are they different from your, our uh, mutual funds? And how do we go about it? Exchange traded funds. Yeah. So, the mutual funds, I mean, whichever we are talking about, is actively managed by a manager. So he will take his decisions based on what he feels is right. The exchange traded funds, they actually follow an index. You know, uh, Ritesh talked about uh, Nifty 50. He talked about the BSE Sensex. There could be a bank Nifty. There could be a pharma Nifty, some technical Nifty, IT Nifty. So basically, these exchange traded funds are passive funds. So they are, uh, there is no great uh, rocket science in it. The fund just follows the index that they are following. So their um, cost of running that fund instead of 1.5%, maybe 0.5%, which is a big difference annually. And history, historically, if you see, these funds have for most of the time have actually done better than the actively managed funds. So if you ask me as a newcomer, get partly into exchange traded funds based on certain index don't go for the you know specific bank nifty or uh, pharma mm. nifty and go in for what we have nowadays called multi cap funds mm. there there is the returns are actually better than the uh, large cap or the mid cap funds and the fund manager has the you know flexibility of choosing the percentage of uh, stocks that he wants to buy and the other thing which has been around is the flexi cap. But there it is actually the it's, the cap is, uh, you know, sort of fixed there. So uh, this multi cap is a better option. And ETF is very good for beginners. So all three actually options are good for beginners. Thank you, sir. So I have a question for Dr. Ritesh, actually. Uh, sir, you mentioned in your talk that, you know, don't go for life insurance policies. 
uh, would you like to elaborate on that because you know we uh, i mean our parents and everyone around us is talking about this lic policy that lic yeah. policy so uh, please elaborate on i mean what you have to say about it can i make a counter question has any lic policy make anyone rich yeah that's a very valid question and the answer would be no i guess never see it has made rich but not the us it has made rich the uh, those brokers <laughs> who sell the lic policies <laughs> the brokerage is very heavy you know right. it is up to the tune of 25 to 50 percent of our mm -hmm. overall investments so why we should pay that much money to the lic where we are not getting anything in return the returns are meager only it's very less so and uh, lic policy see everyone thinks that uh, after me lic policy will give some money to my uh, dependent person so for that purpose, there is another thing which is known as term insurance. Hmm. I could not cover hmm. in my talk uh, yes, because sir. of the quality of time. But term insurance is very important. Take a term insurance of a good amount of many crores, maybe one crore or two crore or more than that. Take a term insurance that is good for your dependents. Suppose if anything happens or any vegetality happens to the policy holder, then all the loans can be uh, taken care of by uh, term insurance. Do not get dependent on LIC policies because it is not giving any kind of return. Whosoever has invested in LIC policies, I request them, if it is near maturity, just complete them and do not reinvest again. If you are you have just started LIC policy, just stop payment and invest in better methods as compared to your LIC policies. But LIC policies are not going to make you rich. It is making rich only to the brokers. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. So, um, Arundhati, if there are no questions from the audience, then maybe we can... Yes, sir. Chadda, sir. Do, do do I have two minutes? Yes, Please, sir. Okay. I have a question for you from no, the no, I, no, no, it's not nothing to do with my talk, but it's to do with Nalini's talk. See, Nalini is a professional finance person, and she forgot mm -hmm. that she was talking to dumb doctors. So we are in that category, you know, like you have those books, so a word for dummies and <laughs> Excel for dummies. So GST for dummies, I... there are two or three things you should all realize. The important thing she talked about business, the doctors, including myself, I had this notion that up to 20 lakhs income, I don't have to bother about GST. So I could have, uh, say, 16 lakhs from my professional income and 3-4 lakhs from the other sources and get away with it. Then one CA taught me, it is not income, it is incoming. Yeah. That means yeah. your interest, your dividends, your PPF interest, everything has to be put together and you become 20 lakhs, one rupee, you are liable for GST. So I have been saying this for the last five years at different fora. Please, 99% of us need to register for GST. If there is one, like for example, my colleague at Hinduja Hospital uh, has a huge income, but it's all from Hinduja Hospital. He doesn't step out of the hospital. You guys even may not know him, but he's one of the best endocrinologists in the country. I can vouch for that. He's my senior and uh, you won't get to see him unless it's a meeting in Mumbai. Then you may be lucky to see him. So mm -hmm. those are very few. That's a handful. Otherwise, most of us are you know, working with the pharma, taking lectures somewhere, uh, writing books, getting on uh, royalty, so, in short, Nalini, we all need to be registered for GST and then look for a good CA to help us out. So, there is one question for you. This is um, the question is about the healthcare policy insurance. Somebody asked that mm -hmm. what are the points that we should look for when we are registering for a healthcare insurance, which is a good healthcare insurance for us. I had seen that in Ritesh's slide. He wants to take that. I, I forced him to put it out. Yes, sir. See. I always say that uh, we all should have a healthcare policy. Though we are doctors and in our own hospitals, we have all the facilities, whatever we demand. Even uh, we are working in corporate hospitals in most of the places. The corporate hospitals are providing best of the best facilities. But still, I advocate every doctor, every person among us should take a healthcare policy. That is a mandatory thing because we do not know when we need it. Many a times I have seen that after retirement from the from their own hospitals, the doctors need healthcare uh, funds. And at that time, the hospitals are not covering their uh, diseases or the hospitalization expenses. So healthcare uh, policies are mandatory. That is number one. Number two, 
it should be of a very good amount minimum 10 lakhs policy a family floater though the premium is high but that is worth it because if we are earning and we are not uh, able to spend on our own then what is the need in earning so we should uh, have a very good policy minimum 10 lakhs you can take a super top up till 1 crore that is also a good uh, concept take a policy from a renowned company which has least deductions in the overall hospitalization bill that is very important mm -hmm. see i am a surgeon regularly i am uh, seeing the bills of patients and all the uh, insurance companies also many companies have a deductions in the tune of 10% or 20% which is known as a copay also so never take a policy which has a copay clause take a policy from the company which is never gives a, never takes a clause of copay avoid the copay also avoid i am a blunt person so i can take it directly avoid government insured companies because there are a lot of deductions in government insured companies like national new india or oriental yeah. at the end the consumer has to pay a hefty amount on the overall final hospitalization bill as compared to the insurance company the other insurance companies like icic lombard bajaj alliance hdfc ergo or neva bhupa they have a good track record and they pay most of the bills of the hospitalization expenses so choice is up to the individual they go for they want to go for a lesser premium or they want to go for a more facilities thank you so much dr ritesh so, uh, quickly to add what ritesh said Number one, check up your bed charges in a good hospital in your city. Hmm. So that should be at least 1% of the policies because most companies would say we will give you 1% bed charges. So uh, at least I know at Hinduja Hospital, then, then 10 lakhs is not enough. You need a larger policy. And when you're young, if you'll see between 10 and 15 and 20, there's much, not much difference not much. in premium. And it's like a good fancy meal or a little holiday outside. Please remember that most corporate hospitals don't give free care anymore, number one. And number two, most of us are traveling across this country. Forget the globe, but at least across the country. God forbid we fall ill somewhere outside our own city. How do I get to my hospital? So there is no option. You have to take a good, decent health insurance. Uh, I would say between 20 and 25 lakhs and top it with whatever is possible. Please, you'll be surprised at what it could cost you if you fall ill. Right, sir. So I think we've had a wonderful uh, session. The one and a half hours just passed on like that and we were all glued to our chairs. So this was indeed a great uh, session. Thank you. And for the vote of thanks, I shall now invite my co-host, Dr. Nitin Kapoor. Thank you, Arundhati. And I think, as you rightly said, we've just had a fantabulous session. I've been just tracking the numbers of uh, audience, both on our endocrine website and the YouTube channel where it's been live streamed. And the number has just not dwindled at all. Everybody is just glued. So we had over 500 registrations. And even on the live YouTube channel, it has just stuck on to the same number all throughout the session. So thank you so much, uh, Manoj Chatta, sir, for taking our time from your very busy schedule and accepting this uh, invitation. Thank you, Dr. Nalini and Dr. Ritesh for uh, also giving fantabulous jobs. Uh, Dr. Varsha and Kanti, fantastic uh, questions and the discussion that we've had. And uh, a big thanks to all the audience that we've had. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanjay Badara, sir, for staying all throughout. And uh, I think on behalf of Endocrine Society, this is the last uh, Voice of Endocrinology webinar this year. We'll come back with uh, another series of webinars next year. I think Manoj, sir, had a point to make no, no. the last no. word. No. So, Nitin, uh, I just want to say that whatever I just talked was actually I was living it. I work now maybe 9 to 2. I don't work after that. And uh, I have all the time in the world. Great. Thank you so much, sir, for sparing that time for all of us here. And it was really helpful. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Good night. And uh, good, have night. A good night. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.